Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for our first Embrace Aging session. Um, I am um, joining this session from the traditional unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan Nation and their people. And I also want to acknowledge that many of you might be joining here in Kelowna, but also um, many other places. And I want to also take this moment to acknowledge the traditional owners past and present of those lands as well. Um, my name is Joan Batorf. I'm a professor in the School of Nursing here at UBC Okanagan and director for the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention. Um, this is our eighth annual Okanagan Embrace Aging and we're really delighted to offer a full program this year. Um, as I mentioned, it was this uh, program was launched uh, eight years ago with four events, and we have continued to expand over the years to celebrate and raise awareness about positive aging. And once again, we have organized over 30 events during the month of March. So we're delighted that this is our first and hope that many of you will be able to join us for some of the other events as well. The sessions that we're offering this year are designed for everyone, young and old alike. And as you will see, if you look on our website, um, the, uh, they address a variety of topics related to healthy aging and improving the life of everyone, uh, but particularly seniors and their families. Our goal is to really inspire healthy and positive aging for everyone. You will notice that we have a closed captioning box that can be moved to the, your preferred place on your screen by just dragging it uh, to anywhere that it's uh, helpful for you to use if you want to use it. You can also turn off the closed captioning by selecting the live script, script button on your menu bar. Um, we will have some time for questions and, con and uh, comments uh, at the end of our presentation. And I would encourage you to type your comments into the chat box at any time during the presentation and we'll read them out to our speaker. So today's event in particular for em Embrace Aging is brought to you from UBC Okanagan by the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention. The title is uh, Hearts Being Out of Time, The Experience of Patients Before and After Atrial Fibrillation Diagnosis. And I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ryan Wilson, who is a colleague and a postdoctoral fellow here in our School of Nursing in the Faculty of Health and Social Development right on our campus here in Kelowna. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wilson. Thanks, Dr. Boroff. Thank you, everybody, and uh, welcome. I'm excited to be sharing um, my passion with you and my research that I've been um, working on for, I guess it's almost about 10 years uh, since I've, I've started this whole journey. Um, just a bit about my background. I'm, I'm an emergency room nurse before I was a, um, um, a professor and teaching at UBC Okanagan. And I fell in love with uh, cardiovascular um, conditions and, and treating and working with patients that have those conditions. So uh, that's sort of just a sense of where I come from and, and the lens that I bring to everything. And I've always been very patient centered and wanting to help and work with patients um, with whatever conditions they have. So um, I'm gonna share a bit today uh, just get to my outline here. Sorry, I'm having trouble skipping screens. There we go. The outline. So just so we're all on the same page, I'm going to first start by defining uh, atrial fibrillation. Then I'm going to discuss my motivation for uh, doing atrial fibrillation research. I'm going to explore the results of um, my PhD work, which looked at the pre-diagnosis symptom experience of AFib. And then we're, we're gonna end with a bit of a how-to approach on, on how should you best care for um, atrial fibrillation if you, if you have um, the, that condition. 
Okay, just so again, so we're on the same page, um, we can look at what atrial fibrillation is. So atrial fibrillation, the top, top part of your heart is beating at beats of up to three to 400 beats per minute. Normally that's in time with the lower part of your heart and it, it beats in unison. So when, when that happens, it causes your, the ventricles, which creates the pulse, it causes that to be uh, fast and irregular as well. Of course, not at rates of four to 600, but they can be rates up to 150, 160, 170, depending on, on um, each individual person. So that's sort of a bit of what the heart is doing in atrial fibrillation. What are the risk factors for it? There's many sort of risk factors uh, that, that make patients susceptible to getting atrial fibrillation. Some of the common ones include hypertension, heart failure, coronary artery disease, and valvular disease. Symptoms, we're gonna talk a lot about the symptoms patients experience in atrial fibrillation this morning, and there's a range of them you can see on the, on the slide. The last thing is the pre-diagnosis. I just wanna define what that is. So that's the period of time from first symptoms, first awareness of symptoms that patients have until they actually get an official diagnosis. So what is my motivation for doing this? As I said, I was uh, an eMERGE nurse and saw lots of patients that had atrial fibrillation. Um, and when they would often, patients, you know, many times they would come in um, and, you know, treating with someone that has a stroke and we would connect them up to the monitor and they would be in atrial fibrillation. And yet there was no documented evidence of, of atrial fib on their chart. And I would ask these patients or the family, you know, did you know you had atrial fibrillation? And, and many of the patients hadn't heard of it or weren't aware of it. So even at that point, when I first started my career, I began to question what, what are patients doing in this time frame? What are they experiencing? And how come uh, they weren't able to get a diagnosis and treatment for their atrial fibrillation and, and ended up having a stroke? So that's the first motivation has always been to really help patients avoid having a stroke or having complications associated with AFib. Um, the second thing is to improve self-care after diagnosis. So many patients get a diagnosis with AFib and then are left with many questions and, and can cause uh, stress and anxiety in their life because they don't really know uh, what to expect with their condition or, or how, how to care for themselves. So that's the program of research I'm building, ways to help patients identify and create, create knowledge and understanding in patients before diagnosis and then help them care for themselves after diagnosis. Okay, so the, the purpose of my PhD work was to sort of look at this pre-diagnosis period because again, I really wanted to understand what were patients experiencing, how were they making decisions and were, what were they doing to respond to their symptoms? Um, were they going to the emergency room? Were they doing other things? Because there really wasn't a lot of evidence, research evidence to explain what was happening in this, in this period of time. The second aim I really wanted to look at is, is there differences in experiences based on age or gender? And the reason those are important is because eventually um, I hope to build interventions that can help patients and getting as much of a perspective of, of, of the different experiences patients have will help build um, interventions. So the methods I used for my work, it was a qualitative study, which means I mainly focused on interviews with patients. I recruited over seven months um, period of time, and it was all patients from the Okanagan, from the atrial fibrillation clinic we had at uh, KGH, from a coach clinic, which maybe some of you have been to, um, and the race clinic, which is a rapid access to cardiac evaluation. Um, so I did interviews with patients and talked about their, their pre-diagnosis symptom experience, and they ranged from 60 to 90 minutes. And I also did a symptom checklist, which looked at the most common and frequent symptoms they had, and then they were able to rate their symptoms based on how severe they were. And that helped inform the, the conversations that we had, where we had a starting place to look at the symptoms they were experiencing. So I won't spend much time on this, just quickly the sample characteristics um, you know, I really want to draw your attention to the, the on the right side of your, your screen, uh, the EDG and the LDG. So just what that is, is that's the early diagnosis group. So I considered those to have an early diagnosis if they, if they had a diagnosis within 48 hours of first becoming aware of symptoms. 
And then I, I categorize those as having a later diagnosis if it was over 48 hours. And I'll, I'll give you a greater breakdown of, of, of those time frames as we move forward this morning. But you can see most patients actually had um, a, a, a greater than 48 hour period of symptoms before they ended up with a diagnosis. And why is 48 hours important? Um, when we're treating atrial fibrillation, there's a, usually a 48 hour window that if, they've, if you've had AFib for less than 48 hours, we're able to cardiovert you um, without doing um, anticoagulation ahead of time. And if it's been longer than 48 hours, you usually have to go on a three week duration of anticoagulants um, to ensure that there isn't a clot that is formed. So it's just, that's sort of the window that we use. So what are the key findings from my research? First is really, again, providing information about what patients experience, providing a detailed information that we can use to design interventions from. The second thing was I really able to decipher the differences between what was it that patients did that received an early diagnosis versus what was it that those that ex experienced a long, long period of time before diagnosis. And the third thing is I really looked at different differences and similarities between men and women. Men and women have much different experiences often in atrial fibrillation. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about that this morning. So these are the main themes. When you're doing qualitative research, you look for what are the main themes within the, within the interviews. You look at all the data, you put all the interviews into text, and then you, we go through it line by line and come up with all of the themes that were in there. And so I was really looking at how people perceived, became aware of their symptoms, how they evaluated it, and how they responded. So we're gonna just go through very quickly this morning some of these themes that, that came out. So the first thing I really wanted to know was what were people doing when they became aware of their symptom? What were things that helped bring about awareness for them? So these two main points came out. First was 71% of the patients in my study were actually resting when they became aware of their symptoms. So patients said it was at night, I was sitting in my chair and I could feel my heart racing and I had, and there was no other reason why it would be. So I was really aware of it. Others talked about it, they were doing sporting activities, particularly men, they said, you know, I couldn't get up those hills when I was golfing anymore. I had to use a cart. Um, I was short of breath when I was playing tennis, that was new for me. And women talked more about uh, activities such as walking or hiking or doing yard work um, when they became more aware of their symptoms. So what did they first notice? So the other important piece of one, what sort of symptoms were they noticing when they became aware? And so there was a, there was a wide range. I'm gonna talk about either end of those spectrums. So the first group, so uh, 18 patients or 69% of the patients in my study actually first noticed not much. And they really didn't know they had symptoms until they looked back after their diagnosis. And then it all became more clear. They realized, oh, I was feeling more fatigued or I was feeling more short of breath or I did actually notice that my heart felt a bit funny. So they had these, these sort of this vague sort of period of time where they really didn't feel much, but they were feeling something, if that, if that makes any sense. There's a couple quotes there that help bring it to light. I was feeling something, but nothing really. And um, Monty, and just, you know, these are all just fictitious names that just, that I've added to the data after so that it would, it would um, make more sense or it, it would be a better story to present. So just a bit of nothing, you know, uh, nothing I'd put down to other than you can watch a horror film, have a moment when you go, oh, and then nothing more than that. That was Monty sort of describing his symptoms. So then on the other side of the spectrum, there was patients that had very severe symptoms such as shredding, um, in, in my breastplate, Ellen, or I couldn't feel my lungs as Helen said, she was so short of breath, or I was so dizzy, I fell out, fell into my chair and passed out. So just, just a wide range of, of symptoms that patients experienced. So next I was really interested in, so how did the patients make decisions? Because I, I wanted to know how, how so many patients end up having a stroke and what did they do in that period of, of time um, before they, they got a diagnosis. So this is the process that, I, that came from the data that they, there was a period of speculating, trying to make sense. And actually I called it theorizing because the patients 
said, I, I, my theory was they, they used that language to try to figure out what was happening in their body. Next, they reached for support to try to, to, to make sense of their symptom or their theories. Then there was, there was factors that influenced those theories, and we'll talk about those. And then there was a period of re-theorizing when, you know what, uh, my theory that I'm just out of shape really isn't making sense anymore because these symptoms are carrying on when I'm sleeping or, or um, when I'm sitting in a chair. So there was a period when their theories no longer made sense and they, they had to look for different answers to their symptoms. So this is just using Brenda's language to show that this is why I called them self, self theories because as a lot of patients said, I was actually trying to form a theory about what was happening um, during that period of time. So these are the main theories that patients came up with uh, to make sense of their symptoms. And we're gonna quickly go through each of these to, to give an example of, of how, uh, how patients spoke about each of these theories. So Greg says, I wasn't relating it to AFib. I just thought, I, you know, I was thinking possibly it could be, I was thinking it might be that B bite. I, I was thinking, gee, could this be, am I getting Lyme disease or am I getting something like that? So you see Greg was just, thinking about all these different possibilities for why he was feeling so short of breath and so, so weak and tired. So let's go through a couple of those individual theories that uh, patients came up with. So the first one that 15 patients talked about is they said, it's nothing really. I, I, I didn't, I thought it was nothing. Um, I just thought my heart was being stupid and so what? But then it would, you know, it would go away. I mean, it's not like something bad. So patients just really didn't think that their symptoms meant much of anything. Um, the next group of patients uh, thought, well, maybe I'm just getting older. Yeah, you know, when you get old, you just think it's part of the, the aging process. Oh, well, you know, I'm 76 or I'm 77 or I'm 70, whatever, said Kathy. So because a lot of the patients experienced these vague, nonspecific symptoms, they had had very difficult time putting a finger on 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 that it might be a heart condition causing all this, which really makes sense. And I can appreciate how hard it is to make sense of symptoms that are, are so vague that some patients experience. Others thought, you know what, I'm just my heart is acting up because I'm just too stressed. It's, there's there's nothing wrong with it. I'm just uh, it's racing because I have too much stress in my life. I, I, I think it's just anxiety. And 35 or nine, nine patients thought that it was all related to just the stress of work or relocation or caregiving that was causing their heart to kind of act up. Others thought that, you know what, they just, this is just my asthma or my COPD or because I had an MI in the past or I had a collapsed lung. So they, they related it to the, their pre-existing conditions. So Donna says, I always thought I was just having an asthma attack, but if I look back at it, I was having more than that. It was all related to my AFib. And just some background on Donna, she ended up having symptoms for well over a year and was taking more and more Ventolin to try to treat her shortness of breath. Nothing was working. She ended up in heart failure and she, you know, she gained a lot of weight from the fluid that she was taking on. And she, she finally was so short of breath, she couldn't breathe when she was lying down at night. And that's when she went to the hospital and, and she was in AFib. So she now looks back and realizes that's why all these puffers and things weren't working is because it was actually AFib that was causing her shortness of breath. So it's my fault. So a lot of patients just thought, you know what, I'm overweight. I'm not physically active anymore. And that's why I'm feeling so short of breath. So Monty said, I was perfectly convinced that it was, that it was because of the fact that I was actually overweight that I was having trouble getting up those hills and was making me breathless. Others thought, you know, it's just my diet. Um, a couple of men said, you know, I, I thought my heart was racing because I had too much spicy food last night. Or Margaret thought I, I didn't have enough magnesium in my diet. Or Neil was first found his symptoms after eating ice cream and he looked at the ice cream and saw that there, there was an ingredient in there that wasn't familiar to him. So he Googled it and it could cause uh, heart irregularities. So uh, that's what he figured, you know, if he just didn't eat ice cream anymore, it would be okay. Um, and then uh, Ellen and others thought, you know, maybe I just was having too much coffee. 
Um, others thought just pushing myself too hard. I'm doing too much physical activity and maybe I need to alter how much I'm doing. Um, that's why I'm feeling so short of breath. And then finally, uh, you know, 21 of the 26 people thought their heart, their symptoms originated from their heart, but only eight had thought that it might be a problem with their heart. Okay, so that's the last theory is thinking, you know what, there's something wrong with my heart. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm having an arrhythmia, maybe I'm having a heart attack. And that's, that's what they, um, these patients figured was going on. Okay, so what are the influences on, on how, did, how did, what influenced patients' um, theories that they developed? The first was their expectations. Many patients said, I was too healthy to have heart disease. My, my family, um, I didn't, that was the last thing I expected was having a heart problem because I ate well, I exercise, I take care of myself. So they really weren't thinking anything to do with their heart when their symptoms started. Others thought, conversely thought, you know what? As soon as they started getting symptoms because they had a family history of heart disease, they quickly went to the emergency room because their, their previous experience um, seeing a family member have a heart condition really pushed them to seek treatment. Others just said, you know, I didn't have enough knowledge. How could I make sense of symptoms that I, I, I had no idea what they were? I didn't even know AFib was a thing. And lastly, the characteristics of the symptoms cause challenges for patients because symptoms that, you know, are there for a minute and are gone are often very challenging for patients to make sense of. Because, you know, why would you run to the doctor if your symptoms just disappeared after a minute? And so, but it was when these symptoms kept coming back over and over again that patients often start to think, you know what, maybe there is something going on here. So those are some of the real challenges that, that patients talked about in, in trying to make sense of their symptoms. Where did they find support for their theories and for their, their um, evaluation process? Well, one, and I'm sure you've all done this, is you compared, they compared themselves with other, others. You know, my neighbor, he's about the same age and he doesn't really, he's quite short of breath as well when he was walking. So maybe it's normal for me to be short of breath. Others would actually test themselves. I had one gentleman that would, on his lunch breaks would run up a flight of stairs and then take his pulse and see if he had, his heart was racing. If it wasn't, he would document that. And then his next break, he would do it again because he would go to his doctor and, and, and he would be, there would be no sign of AFib at that time. And, and so he was trying to get some evidence that, you know what, there is something going on with my heart. Others, you know, the eliminating possibilities is, is very common for patients where they would um, you know, they would look for all of these different theories of what was going on. And, and we talked about those theories just a minute ago. And the last thing is reaching out. So they would reach out to, for support from family and friends and just try to see what other family members thought of the symptoms they were experiencing, see if they could get some answers to what, what was going on with them. Okay, so the last major major thing that I looked at is the response. So what did, after they came up with all these theories and tried to figure out and make sense of what was going on with their bodies, what did they do? The, the major thing that patients first did was, was non-treatment. So 77% of them made a deliberate choice to just wait, watch, and hope it would go away. Um, they would talk themselves out of being sick. You know what? There's nothing really going on here. I'm okay. I'm healthy. Others would resort to, you know, if that didn't work, they would then maybe try self-treatment, um, such as stopping, resting, laying down. Some patients were forced to lay down because of how severe their symptoms were. Um, coughing or deep breathing. One gentleman talked about on the golf course for over a year, he would, his heart would start racing and he would do a couple of big coughs and some deep breathing and it would sort of reset his heart and then he would just continue on with that. Um, others did lifestyle modifications to the extent of even changing jobs because they felt their job was too stressful and that's why their heart was racing. And the last thing was health seeking. So eventually 25 of the 26 patients ended up seeking, um, going to healthcare seeking for their symptoms. The one patient that didn't was because they, they became unconscious and, and were, the ambulance brought them to the hospital so they didn't really have a choice in it. Everyone else, eventually, they worked their way through all of these different theories and ended up deciding that they needed to seek treatment for their symptoms. And we'll talk about the late group having challenges in just a minute. 
Well, we'll talk about it right now. So the differences between the early and the late group, the prolonged treatment seeking group. So I really wanted to make sense of, of what were those in the late group? What were they experiencing different than those in the early group? Why did those in the early group get a diagnosis so much quicker? And so there's a, on the left, you can see is a, a paper I've published recently that sort of breaks down this whole differences between those in the early and late group. And in the references at the end, there'll be a link to my faculty page if you're interested in reading some of the publications I have on this topic. So those in the late group, they, they had intermittent symptoms. So if your symptoms are again intermittent and come and go, it makes it challenging for patients to respond to them. They, they said they didn't have understanding what their symptoms meant. They viewed themselves as healthy. They weren't concerned about what their symptoms might indicate. So they just, they didn't have much concern about it. They attempted self-care strategies for periods ranging over, over, you know, over a year, um, trying to treat their symptoms themselves. Um, and then often when they would go to the hospital or to their healthcare provider, they weren't in AFib or they weren't given proper diagnostic testing. And so they would leave there more frustrated than when they came. Um, and they would have normal diagnostic tests. So they would maybe get an ECG and it would, nothing would show up. So then they would, some patients would be thinking they were crazy that all, you know, that's their language they use that I, I just really, it was very frustrating to me because I, I would be feeling these things and I would go and there would be nothing that was showing up. Those in the early group, um, they, they were more fearful or worried uh, because of their family history. So as soon as they felt something going on with their heart, they were more uh, quick to run to the, or not run, but to, to go to their healthcare provider to try to get answers. They felt concerned about their symptoms and they were worried about them. They consulted their partners and this was particularly men reaching out to their spouses and saying, you know what, I have, I've been feeling this and their spouse saying, you got to get to the hospital, you got to get to the doctor. And so that's a big reason why men were, their time frames were uh, much less than the women in this, in this um, study. Symptoms that it, uh, occurred at night, nighttime symptoms, because there was no other, patients said there was no other reason why my heart would be racing in the middle of the night, so it was more concerning for me, so I went to the hospital. And then lastly, they thought it was a problem with their heart. So those that thought it was a problem were more likely to, to seek treatment. Okay, um, the next um, thing we're gonna go through is gender differences. So I just wanna read a quote from Len about how he just sort of kind of buried his head in the sand, so to speak. In the back of my mind, I was just hoping these symptoms would go away, hoping it was all just stress related. So I didn't necessarily, I didn't make an appointment right away with my doctor. I was just hoping that this would all go away. So um, I then also looked at the differences between men and women. And women have much, have greater, often have more severe symptoms, more frequent symptoms. They have more difficulty getting a diagnosis. They're often undertreated in terms of anticoagulation for their atrial fibrillation. They're offered less ablation for their treatment of atrial fibrillation. They often have longer door, like door to imaging times related to uh, when they present with symptoms until they actually get some sort of a diagnostic uh, test done. So I wanted to know why, what were the experiences that women were having? Were they different than what men had? So, and sure enough, uh, they had, in my study, they were had more severe symptoms. Um, they also said they had less, you know, they talked about knowledge more than men did, saying they didn't know what AFib was and they didn't have an understanding of it. They talked about challenges with their healthcare provider much more frequently, saying they went to their healthcare provider and they just couldn't get any answers. They didn't think their symptoms were a threat. They viewed themselves as being very healthy and at, not at risk for heart disease. And, and that's the bottom point there, which says immune, where men, none of the men said, I didn't feel like I was at risk for heart disease. And they, they, had, they talked about being more complicated uh, process because of their other, heart, their other conditions that made it difficult for them to understand the new symptoms they were experiencing. Men, on the other hand, were more reliant on their, their partners. They turned to their partners when they had symptoms where the women often kept things to themselves and just carried on with, with everything that was going on in their lives. Uh, men weren't as supportive. The, the, the partners I interviewed, the partners were often in the interviews as well. And the women that had AFib said they would talk to their husbands or their partners about their condition. 
and their partners weren't supportive in, in seeking care. Um, and men had a much shorter period of time before a diagnosis. So only three men had symptoms greater than a year versus 10 of the women. So quite a big difference uh, there in the, the pre, uh, how long they were experiencing symptoms for. Okay, so that sort of covers the first part of the presentation. And um, I'm just gonna now move into, so what does self-care look like? So now that we get a sense of how complicated a lot of these experiences are for patients before a diagnosis, how do, how do patients make sense of their symptoms after a diagnosis? And what are some of the key principles that, that we should be doing? The first thing is, is to maintain your health. So self-care is three parts, maintain, monitor, and manage. And so uh, we're gonna break those down a little, uh, very quickly in the, in the next couple of minutes to show what does it look like to maintain, to monitor, and to manage your heart when you have atrial fibrillation. So the first thing is, is the self-care maintenance. So this is the way you can minimize the risk factors that you have, and that will actually often improve the symptoms of AFib and sometimes reverse it so that you're back into a normal sinus rhythm and your, the, the amount of AFib episodes lessen. So um, sometimes it's recognizing the triggers you have for AFib. So this is from the, the Canadian guidelines uh, just released in uh, this last year. And so uh, limiting alcohol and, and tobacco. So limiting to one, one, less than one drink per day is recommended. And in some patients, even less than that, they can't tolerate any alcohol because it puts them into AFib. Exercise is very important. We'll talk about that in the next slide because it is challenging for some patients to exercise when it puts them into AFib. Sleep apnea is a big trigger for AFib. So if you're having more than 15 apneic events in an hour, then you, you know, that's the goal is to have less than that. And, um, and if you do have more than that, then you need to have uh, CPAP. So making sure you're following up with sleep specialists if you're at risk for sleep apnea. Weight loss. So they found that patients that have more than 10% weight loss, if they were overweight, had an increased BMI, would, would have much uh, which have a great improvement in their symptoms and they would have a six-fold increase in being arrhythmia free over a five-year period. So just by losing weight, it often really helped with their AFib. Keeping your diabetes in control is another thing. So having a hemoglobin A1c of seven, which is for your average uh, blood glucose level and keeping your blood pressure down. Uh, higher blood pressure stretch the atrium and can cause, uh, can increase the risk of AFib. So keeping your blood pressure down um, and then going on antihypertensives if needed to keep that blood pressure down. So this just breaks down the benefits of exercise a little bit more. Um, sorry, some of the slides are blurry there. Uh, they didn't transfer over that well. Um, so you can see that just exercising, this is what's recommended is three to five days a week to a maximum heart rate of 50 to 70%. Okay, um, so what does, what does that mean? What's your maximum heart rate? Well, you can take the number 220 and subtract your age. So I'm just over 40. Um, so my maximum heart rate would be 220 minus 40, which would be 180. So if I had AFib, initially the exercise I would be recommended would be to have a heart rate of between 90 and 120 when I was exercising. Um, so you can, you can do the math to see what range you should be falling in. Um, target of greater than 200 minutes per week is what you should be aiming for for your exercise. And you should be doing aerobic exercise and resistant training. They don't recommend heavy weights, but more sort of bands and um, sort of resistance sort of training. And so on the right side, you can see some of the benefits of exercise. You can see that after six months, patients had reduced burden of symptoms um, and over the long period, they were more AF free and had reduced overall, those that weren't AF free had less symptoms because of the exercise they were doing. Potentially reverses things such as um, the atrial remodeling that happens in your heart, improves your blood pressure, your, your glycemic control, inflammation that's going on. So there's lots of benefits to doing exercise as a maintenance for, for atrial fibrillation. So the next part is um, how do I care? For, how, do I, how do I monitor my heart? And monitoring is really, really important. And um, a lot of patients don't even 
don't really know how to take their pulse or how to monitor their heart. So um, I recommend, and you know, in the literature, there's getting to be more evidence about the importance of self-monitoring in atrial fibrillation. But as a, as a starting place, you should be sort of taking your pulse in the morning and at night and taking a radial pulse on your wrist, if that's comfortable, or else a carotid pulse, either or, just so you can figure out what does your normal pulse feel like and what does it feel like when it's racing and in atrial fibrillation. Being aware of your symptoms is really important. Being able to know if you have increased shortness of breath or fatigue. Um, and these are all signs that your AFib maybe isn't being managed and you can talk to your healthcare provider about. Be aware of your triggers. It might be alcohol, it might be stress, it might be caffeine, it might be nicotine, and then minimizing those triggers to keep you event free. Keeping a symptom diary is really important because then you have patterns that you can, because we all forget things when we get to our healthcare provider, but if you have a pattern and a log that shows you what was happening when you ended up having symptoms, it can help tailor your treatment. And should, should be, you should be educated about the signs of a stroke at the very least so that you know, because that's, I mean, that is the biggest risk associated with un, untreated AFib um, is, is having a stroke. So just being aware of what those signs are is, is really important. Um, I just, this is just some pictures of some devices that can be used for monitoring that patients often have and that you know, and a lot of these are the more high-tech devices. So it's the practice is changing on how we're able to monitor our hearts. A lot of you might have a smartwatch and you're always getting data. And that's so good. The more information you have about what's going on with your heart, um, the better. So just just really make sure if you do have AFib, you're, you're monitoring and you're, you have a, an understanding of what your heart rate is doing sort of on a daily basis. So how do I manage my, my condition? So the biggest thing is medication adherence. And I know maybe patients don't like to hear that, but the medications are what's going to keep you from having a stroke. So if they determine that you are at a stroke risk, they do a whole assessment on you, then it's very, very important to take those anticoagulants to, to minimize that stroke risk. Um, they might choose a rate control or a rhythm control. So you might be on different medications based on the strategy if they're trying to just control your heart rate or if they're trying to put you back into the normal sinus rhythm. I recommend having an AF plan. We'll look at that quickly in the, the next slide. And um, other strategies to control your strength symptoms. And a lot of the patients in my study had done this. And you know, deep breathing, try to reduce your stress, changing your environment so that you, you have a calmer environment can often help reduce those triggers. This is just an example, and we're almost done here. I know we're getting close to our time. Um, is this is an example of what a personal rest plan is. And this is something that I'm, I'm this is um, from a researcher, um, Gallagher in um, Australia, and I'm gonna be designing something similar for hopefully to be implemented in our healthcare system, where we can have a standardized way that we treat patients and that they have, they have a greater understanding of their condition and what to do when symptoms occur. So we're gonna just unpack this a little bit in the next slide, what, what actually rest looks like and how you can actually respond to your symptoms when they occur. So rest, the first thing is if you, if you feel like you're having symptoms, relax, rest, stay calm. Most episodes pass over time and most episodes are not harmful and are, um, and again, will we'll self-resolve. And this is when you first introduced to AFib, you often have more events that come and go and sometimes patients get into more of a persistent AFib and then some are even in permanent AFib. So this is sort of tailored to uh, this slide is, you know, when you're in that stage where you're just getting symptoms that are coming and going. This next thing is to estimate your pulse. Again, knowing how to take your pulse and recognize if it's regular, if it, is it beating in, in time uh, over a minute or is it beating all over the place and recognize if it's fast. Is it beating over 100 beats per minute? Sometimes you'll have a specific plan from your doctor. See your, uh, see your specific plan, such as a pill in the pocket, um, which means you can take an extra medication that might help slow your heart rate or, or put you back in a normal sinus rhythm. And then know when to call for help. You don't just wait it out if you're feeling extreme symptoms, such as fainting, shortness of breath, dizziness, chest pain. Those are the sorts of things that you then want to get uh, uh, immediate treatment for. 
So when do you see your doctor? And this is often I get people say, you know what, I, when do I go to my doctor if I think I have atrial fibrillation? Um, palpitations are very normal amongst the general public and, the, and they're, they're often benign and not to be worried about. Um, some of the common causes of palpitations are caffeine or too much stress in your life or which we all have a lot of that it seems. Hormones uh, changing, exercise, fevers, thyroid disorders. So palpitations that are infrequent and last only a few seconds are, are not to be concerned about and, and don't need more evaluation. It's those that are lasting greater than, you know, a few seconds. If you have runs of irregularity, they're lasting, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, you're able to take your pulse and you can feel that. Then that's more concerning and that is not just a palpitation. That's often some arrhythmia that's happening with your heart. So again, just to stress, when do you seek medical medical attention is if you have those severe symptoms, um, then you go right away. If you have those mild symptoms and you just feel like your heart is racing a little bit, then it's, and this is new for you, then I recommend that you get an appointment to see your doctor, um, you know, in, the, in that 48 hour period. You don't need to necessarily run to the emergency um, if you aren't in a constant AFib. If your pulse is in that, that constant irregular state, then yes, it's good to go to the emergency room to maybe to get it cardioverted and to get it treated right away. Okay, and that sort of wraps, wraps up sort of the self-care and when to seek a doctor. Um, this is just a model that I created for my work and it sort of captures that whole symptom experience pieces. I hope this was helpful to answer some of your questions that you might've had and I'm, I'm happy to have a discussion about some of your experiences or answer any questions that I'm able to. Great, thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, this has been really interesting and we already have a few questions and comments. And the first one is from Barb and it's something that I'm interested in as well is the, is the sex or gender differences that you talked about because it seemed to me that uh, what from what you said, uh, women are experiencing more severe symptoms and yet they have more difficulty getting uh, those symptoms attended to. Mm -hmm. And Barb talks about her experience. She says, you're so right about the difference between men and women. I had an appointment to have, my, have a heart pack put on. I got dumped and my husband was fitted with a heart pack twice before I got called four months later. He even ironically had the first pack put on the same day and time I originally booked to get mine. Wow. So I guess, what yeah. advice do you have for women? How can we get the attention and the healthcare services that we might need at a time we might be experiencing symptoms of AFib? What do we need to say or do? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think having, I, that was the experience and it's, it's, it's shocking that, that that still goes on, right? And, and that there's still that culture that, that heart disease is a man's issue, and it it really it really couldn't be further from the truth. And and um, I you know I think having that self care monitoring, if you have a log of this is you know, and you have documented evidence in a way that you know this is what I was doing. My heart rate was 120, and it was an irregular. And so I think. At, um, if you have more evidence to bring to your healthcare provider, then it's harder for them to, to just uh, turn you away and not give you diagnostic testing. And the diagnostic testing is hopefully getting better as we move forward, less cumbersome, you know, the halter monitors that some of you may have experienced that are wires all over the place. They're getting more smaller patches that you can wear up to 30 days and that will transmit all the data and they can shower with them and everything. So. Hopefully as technology keeps evolving that it'll be easier to capture a lot of these events in, in patients that are having these, these transient bouts of atrial fibrillation. But my advice is, you know, part of it is my research. I wanna work on the healthcare system to try to bring more awareness that, you know, what are, the, what are patients experiencing and the challenges. And then on the patient side is again, just try to have as much evidence as you can and to be, to be sort of no, what are the possible tests that I want to get a, a ECG or a halter because my symptoms are so intermittent. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Jean. Is there any research that shows a correlation between AF 
and stomach issues and or vagus nerve irritability? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know of anything related to stomach. I know maybe that has related to nerves, potentially being nervous or anxious. Often people have stomach conditions and that can precipitate AFib from the anxiety. And the vagal nerve, sometimes patients have a vagal nerve related AFib. So they get, that's their trigger for them is their vagal nerve, such as eating a big meal. And that's when puts them into arrhythmia where others have it more a stimulant based trigger where it's exercise or stress heightened sort of sympathetic nervous system. So there are those two sort of triggers. Uh, there's quite a few triggers, but those are two of them. But I don't know specific research related to um, stomach conditions on their own. It's not on the list of, of, of the Canadian guidelines as possible causes. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, another question, did any of your study participants ask if supplementation to close nutrient gaps, such as omega-3 fatty acids, would decrease the risk of atrial fibrillation? So I guess this is around efforts to self-manage, uh, decrease your risk through diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, that didn't come up at all. I, there were other supplements patients were trying, such as magnesium. Uh, magnesium is often known to be uh, um, really uh, beneficial to the heart. Um, and I mean, they tried a lot of things in their diet, but I, I don't, I can't speak to actually um, the benefits of using omega-3 for atrial fibrillation. I do, I am just going into this whole world of self-management and, and, and that's one of the things is the maintenance aspect of looking the specifics of getting into the literature about what diet things can actually help your AFib because there is there is a whole body of research that's starting to look at that as well. So great question. I wish I could answer it more. Well, clearly there's a lot to learn about AFib that we still don't know a lot about. Yes. And uh, we have a comment as well from Beverly. Uh, had it, I'm assuming that's AFib years ago, now chronic pain from back surgery. So how to get started, how to start getting my heart checked? Now with the virus, everything is put back more to see doctors, et cetera. And I think a lot of people have had the experience of, of uh, delays because of our current pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the question is about how do we get the attention of doctors in this current context when it comes to symptoms related to AFib? Yeah, that's that is that is the the problem, right? All of our first appointments are virtual, and and again, I think it points to being as informed as you possibly can. If you have sort of documented that you've you know this was my pulse, this is what I was doing, this is having that evidence, and then you can get an in person. Uh, visit to get or maybe referred uh, your physician could probably refer you to outpatient clinic to get fitted for a halter monitor or assessment in that way without even seeing it so just being as informed and educated as you possibly can with as much evidence about what you were doing maybe being able to even identify some of the triggers and it's it's sad that it it's it's you know I don't know of any other conditions I'm sure there are, but I'm just so involved in AFib. What it takes for so many patients, it takes so much work to try to get a diagnosis mm -hmm. um, because it, it can be so elusive. So um, more than, you know, it's why that having that awareness and that understanding what AFib is and the symptoms and how to monitor it, even before you have a diagnosis is so important. It will really help expedite that process. But yeah, in this new world, it's it's got to be done virtually and in a lot of times, then you have to just be able to more so be able to take your pulse and have that evidence to yeah. present to them. So good advice, learn how to take your pulse or get a pulse monitor of some type and keep a diary, obviously, that you can yeah. refer to. And even Maybe your phones um, ha have applications that you can, you can, you know, search in the app store that you can put your finger over the camera and it will take your pulse that way. <laughs> There's lots of little add-on devices that can give you, and of course, Apple Watches and Fitbits and all these things, we can have all this extra data that can help support um, and our maintenance and management of our, of our heart. Yeah, exactly. So Anya says, it took me 10 years to get diagnosed properly. I was told I had anxiety attacks. 
-hmm. I retired early after going on disability leave, first because of my irregular heartbeat. Now I'm diagnosed and on meds. Can you talk about the progress of the disease? Uh, can you live long with it? Or mm -hmm. will you die sooner because of a stroke? Also, is AFib considered a heart disease? Um, yes, yeah, it is, it is considered heart disease. Um, it, there are reversible causes of AFib that aren't considered heart disease, such as um, sometimes people have uh, an event such as a, a, you know, severe illness that causes their heart because their electrolytes are out of balance um, that puts them in AFib. But um, the if you have that primary cause where it's caused from years of hypertension and stretching the atrium um, or those other comorbidities that we talked about, um, um, coronary artery disease or things, then that's, that's the primary mechanism and it's considered heart disease. Um, and what was the, the other part of the first question, Joan? It was... So um, it's like the progress of the disease. Can oh, you have yeah. to live long with this? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, so AFib is very treatable and very manageable and the stroke risk can be, can be managed. And that's why I stress the importance of taking medications. I know so many of us don't like taking meds and we, but I mean, if you are on, um, if you're, you know, they assess your stroke risk, risk based on something called CHADS VASC and uh, it looks at all of your risk factors for having a stroke. And if they, you know, your healthcare provider sees that you have a high enough stroke risk with your AFib, then you, you need to be on a blood thinner probably for the rest of your life or until you have maybe, um, sometimes you can get AFib reversed through procedures such as ablation or, um, and then be AFib free and you wouldn't need to be on it. But no, uh, it, you know, it is a condition, it's a chronic disease that you can live a long, long, healthy life with it. It just, it just takes management of it. Um, and there, I've talked to many patients that, you know, they are now completely free of symptoms and they're able to um, live a, a normal life. So it's, it is for some people, it just means being on a certain medication to limit their risks for the rest of their life. Um, but, you know, for a lo lot of patients, it can be well managed with, with proper medications or ablation procedures or uh, there's a lot of evidence coming out in the, the maintenance of, of minimizing risk factors, such as decreasing your weight, stopping drinking, stopping smoking, all those cardiovascular things that will help improve um, your health and sometimes put patients that were in AFib to be AFib free. Right. So this next question is actually about ablation. So uh, Cheryl writes that she's uh, been successfully treated with low amounts of meds and has explored ablation with her cardiologist, but uh, she appears not to want me to go through this process. Can you tell me, can you speak to why this might be? So I guess it's when, when does ablation come into people's treatment plans? So ablation is becoming more and more common and more and more uh, the evidence for early ablation is, is there's been a couple of big studies that came out this year about the import or the effectiveness of early ablation, meaning um, not waiting that, that patients have struggled for many years trying to manage their AFib before they're a candidate. So I think we're going to start seeing ablation being offered to patients sooner. The problem is there's only so many places you can be um, ablated in, um, in our province and there's only so many labs and, and so many spots. And um, so they had fairly strict criteria of who were ablated. You usually had to have a fairly high symptom burden and you had to be in that early stages of AFib with a high symptom burden and, and that, you know, other rhythm and rate control methods weren't necessarily working for you. And that was just a kind of like, because there are risks with ablation and sometimes it doesn't work. Um, and so that they would often, you know, choose those other options first. But I think with some of the evidence coming out now that there's going to be more money putting into developing uh, greater capacity to do ablations in our, in our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So Patty writes, how common is it for a patient to feel relatively normal, but it be in constant AFib? Mm -hmm. This was the result when I wore a Holter monitor for a 24 hour period. Yeah, so it's almost good. like you've got AFib, but you don't really know it because you're feeling okay. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> 
it's such an interesting condition you as that one slide you can show the spectrum of something that is those vague imperceptible symptoms that they're there but they're not really there to those that are have severe so as you know the literature says up to 30 percent of patients are in what's called asymptomatic AFib, so they don't really have uh, a lot of symptoms at all, but they're in AFib, um, where others are extremely symptomatic. So um, it is it is quite common for patients to really not know they have AFib, and and that's a great challenge. I mean, how can you respond to something that you don't really know you have or you can't feel? Um, but the interesting part of my study was is that I you know. I talked to patients that thought they didn't have symptoms, but then when we really looked at their history and their story, they realized, you know what, I was having things, but they were just so subtle. I thought they were other things going on. I thought it was aging. I thought it was uh, that I was overweight or so it is interesting that, you know, there are those that truly maybe don't have symptoms. And then there's those that just aren't sort of, there's the symptoms are so subtle that they're not recognizing them to be uh, related to their heart. Mm -hmm. I guess it, the telltale is that, you know, even checking your pulse every once in a while might be a good idea. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, this has been uh, really fabulous. I think we've come to the end of our comments and questions, and I see that we're um, uh, nearly out of time as well. So in these last few, last minute or so, I'd like to thank you very much for sharing this research for us. As you can see by the questions and comments, it's of interest to a lot of people, uh, this whole topic, and likely to continue to be of interest for some time. And of course, we'll want to hear about your continuing research in this area. And um, I do, um, do you have any closing comments, Ryan? Oh, I, I just wanted to just put up if, I don't know if, Jaquetta, you can put that in the chat box if they wanted to look at my, some of the other studies that, or the, the papers that I have published, if, that's the link to it there. I don't know if how I can get that to everyone. Maybe I can cut and paste it into the chat. But um, no, I just I'm I'm happy to do something like this again if you know where we can look at other topics in AFib and how to manage it. And, right. And, yeah. That's wonderful. So I want to also thank everyone for joining us today, and I hope that you'll be able to join us for other Embrace Aging events in the future. So check out our website for the other events at okanaganembraceaging.com and we'll look forward to seeing you again. So thanks, uh, Ryan. Thanks yeah. everybody for joining us. Thank you. All thanks right, bye questions. for now. Okay, bye-bye.